Ajá, pero... Bienvenidos al Cerebro Matemático. El Cerebro Matemático hace parte de la iniciativa Cerebro y Aprendizajes, un coloquio anual organizado por el Colegio Hacienda Los Alcaparros, que desde el 2017 se ha celebrado anualmente. En contados instantes daremos inicio a la cuarta versión de esta serie con el Cerebro Matemático. Antes de empezar, les recomendamos seguir las instrucciones en pantalla para garantizar la mejor experiencia durante este webinar. Para hacer uso de la interpretación simultánea, busque en la barra inferior el icono del globo y haga clic. Escoja el idioma en el que quiere escuchar el evento. Si lo quiere oír en su versión original, no tiene que seleccionar nada. Solo debe dejarlo en off. Si tiene algún problema con la herramienta, puede escribir en el chat y le atenderemos. Las preguntas serán contestadas al final del evento. Por favor, utilice el botón de Q&A, preguntas y respuestas, ubicado en la parte inferior de su ventana. Las preguntas hechas por el chat tendrán menos posibilidad de ser atendidas. Haremos todo lo posible por contestar el mayor número de preguntas. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos.
Les presentamos a Rosita Caro, fundadora y directora del Colegio Hacienda Los Alcaparros. Buenos días a todos. Voy a iniciar este evento del Cerebro Matemático reconociendo las personas especiales que somos todos los que estamos aquí. Porque dedicar una mañana a la reflexión sobre el cerebro matemático, una mañana de sábado, de fin de semana, nos hace personas muy especiales. De manera que vamos a pensar, vamos a disfrutar y vamos a reflexionar sobre la maravilla humana que es el pensamiento matemático. Gracias a todos por hacerse presentes. Seguramente los educadores, los padres de familia, los estudiantes que nos acompañan, pues van a encontrar una gran inspiración en las palabras del doctor Roger Antonsen y una gran cantidad de ideas en las invitaciones que nos hará la doctora Laura Gómez Bermeo, a quienes presentaré en algunos minutos. ¿Cómo algo tan exacto como la matemática puede explicar lo inexacto e impredecible que constituye el mundo real? ¿Son los números una invención humana cuyo fin es la comprensión de la realidad o son simplemente una manera de acercarse y tratar de interpretarla? ¿Podemos usar la matemática para ser mejores seres humanos? Estas son algunas de las preguntas que nuestros estudiantes de sexto a un décimo grado se hicieron para preparar este coloquio sobre el tema de las matemáticas. Ellos quisieron participar mostrando en los, en los adultos la gran cantidad de preguntas que se están haciendo respecto a lo que están aprendiendo. Y hoy la voz de los jóvenes y su curiosidad en medio de la difícil situación de pandemia que estamos viviendo pues es un gran motivador para dedicar estas horas de reflexión al pensamiento matemático. El mundo necesita un pensamiento innovador y una aproximación diferente, creativa, dedicada a la solución de problemas y la matemática es precisamente la ciencia de la solución de problemas. Esta es la primera charla de una serie de tres. Inspira, enseña, entiende que se llevarán a cabo durante este año lectivo. Los ponentes invitados son educadores, matemáticos y neurocientíficos que buscan comprender cómo expresamos las cosas en el lenguaje de la matemática, cómo buscamos soluciones a los problemas que nos aquejan y cómo exploramos patrones y formulamos ideas y conclusiones que nos permiten diseñar un mundo mejor. Las charlas de hoy no son más que la abrebocas, el punto de partida, la inspiración para iniciar este camino de encuentro entre educadores, matemáticas y la neurociencia. Y seguramente quienes podamos atender esta secuencia de tres charlas saldremos enriquecidos de esta experiencia de reflexión. Sin más preámbulos, les presento al doctor Roger Antonsen. El doctor Antonsen, quien muy amablemente ha aceptado nuestra invitación en, en, este, en este año de la matemática, es científico informático, matemático, lógico, autor, artista y orador público. Es profesor asociado de la Universidad de Oslo en Noruega y es parte del, del, del grupo de investigación Lógica y Datos Inteligentes. Y también es profesor invitado de la Universidad de Berkeley y, y de la Universidad Brown. Está aquí para apasionarnos con el tema que ha traído. Una gran pregunta. ¿Qué son las matemáticas? ¿Y por qué la imaginación es importante para el pensamiento matemático? Bienvenido, doctor Antonio. Nos acompaña también la doctora Laura Gómez, presidenta de la Comisión de Educación de la Sociedad Colombiana de Matemáticas. Es profesora e investigadora de la Universidad Sergio Arbeleda y sus áreas de investigación son la educación matemática, la analítica y el Big Data. Dedica mucho tiempo al desarrollo del talento matemático 
y a la divulgación de la educación matemática en Colombia. Es representante de Colombia en la Comisión Internacional de Educación Matemática y precisamente está presente hoy para hacernos una gran invitación a participar en los eventos del Año de las Matemáticas en Colombia. Bienvenida, doctora Laura Gómez Berné. Y, pues bueno, los dejo con el doctor Roger Antonsen para que tengamos un buen tiempo de oír su propuesta para nosotros hoy. Muchísimas gracias y bienvenidos al Cerebro Matemático en este año 2020. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, my name is uh, Roger Antonsen, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Oslo uh, in Norway, where it is currently afternoon. I hope everybody hears me and can see me well. I'm sharing my presentation with you uh, at the same time as I'm talking, and I hope you all can uh, uh, see this. So again, thank you so much for this uh, invitation and all the kind words. I'm privileged and honored to be here today with you. So good morning to everybody who has tuned in. Um, I love mathematics. I love computer science. I love science in general. And I hope to speak to you today about what mathematics is and why I love it so much. And also talk about why the imagination is so important. I will start by presenting myself and then I will go on to share Uh, a lot of experiments and thoughts and ideas uh, about mathematics. And towards the end, I will present uh, a challenge to everyone uh, in which you can apply both mathematics and art. So, so welcome. Um, if anybody has questions, I'm sure you can um, put them into this little Q&A box and um, we will gather them um, up and answer them uh, towards, towards, the, uh, towards the end. Um, So uh, let's go. Um, first, a little bit about myself. I'm from the University of Oslo. I studied there. I started studying philosophy and Latin, but I soon got sucked into the world of mathematics and computer science. I've also spent a little bit of time at UC Berkeley and at ICERM uh, at Brown University in which I participated in a beautiful program called Illustrating Mathematics. And there's now also a book on this topic in which um, I am participating in a couple of experiments like this one, where I'm trying to illustrate the Hilbert curve with various kinds of methods, for example, by cutting up paper or by creating a laser a labyrinth made of wood and laser cutting. I also did some 3D printing. This is a visualization of card shuffling, believe it or not. Um, my day-to-day -day job is teaching. I teach a course called Logical Methods at the university, and I have approximately 400 students per year. And I'm also delighted that um, this book will be published uh, very, very soon. Um, I did my PhD and research on something called mathematical logic and proof theory, and it looks a little bit like this, but we're not going to talk about that today. Um, I'm also engaged in science communication. So um, this TED talk has brought me around the world, has over 3 million views. And I like to look at mathematics from different kinds of perspectives. For example, looking at paper and Uh, all the things you can do with paper. But today we're going to focus on this question here. What is mathematics? So let me start off by sharing a little video that I made um, a while back where I asked this question, what is mathematics? So here we go. What is mathematics? What's the essence of mathematics? If an alien came down and asked us, what is mathematics? What would you answer? To me, mathematics is about finding patterns and we see patterns everywhere. We can fold paper, like in uh, origami, and find beautiful patterns there. Or we could juggle, and we can find juggling patterns and juggle them and make up new ones. Or we can try and solve Rubik's Cube and find out how many ways can we do it. Or we could take music, where one string and another are in harmony, and then we detect patterns in sound. To me, mathematics is about finding patterns. It's about representing these patterns in a particular language, It is about making assumptions and then following these assumptions to see what happens. And that's what we're going to do here. So as you might understand, I like patterns a lot. So what you see in front of you is a beautiful pattern. In fact, it is made of just circles. Circles are varying size. So large circles here and then smaller circles and bigger circles finally. So 
my simple answer to the question, and this is a hard question, what is mathematics really about? My first answer is that it, of course, is about patterns. First and foremost, it's about finding patterns. And by a pattern, I don't refer only to geometric patterns like circles and, and things you can see, but I mean something more general like structure, form, uh, regularity. When you see something happen over and over, that's a pattern and you observe that pattern and that's what mathematics really is about. And I have a very wide definition of what um, mathematics is, but first and foremost, it is about finding patterns. But so is science and so are a lot of other things. So there are some special things that separate out mathematics, I think. And the second part of my definition is that it has to do with representing patterns. So not only do you observe a pattern or you find it, but you represent it in some kind of language. And the language could be music, it could be symbolic, it could be written, non-written, it could be so many different things. What a representation is, is really, really a, a good and difficult question, but it's about ultimately to find patterns and represent them in, in a language. And the third part, it's about making assumptions. We all make assumptions on what um, exists in the world. What sort of logical um, view do you, do you have of the world? There's so many things that play a role. For example, your world might be finite and not infinite. And there's so many hidden assumptions. And the fourth part is just seeing what happens and kind of reasoning from those assumptions. So I'm a logician. So I'm used to reasoning from assumptions to conclusions. And that is an art of trying to find out what follows from what. It is not unlike what you do in um, a, a doctor's office when you present your symptoms and the doctor tries to reason out what is wrong, uh, what is the diagnosis, or in a court of law in which you have somebody that has done something and you want to find out what does really follow logically from those assumptions. And that is uh, the art of practicing law. So uh, as a logician, I'm very um, familiar and happy for number three and four, but to today we're going to focus on um, one and two, which is patterns and, and finding them and, and see all the fun that we can, we can have with that. Because patterns are really everywhere. This is just rotating triangles. And I love computer programming, and this is something I made on the computer just for, for playing with, with patterns. And um, let me also tell you a little bit about representing things. So these are, you know, the, the tie knots that you often tie, and they have different patterns. And we can represent them with languages. For example, we can set, put, give names to them. This is an oriental knot, four in hand, half Windsor. But we can also make a symbolic language like left out, right in, center out, and tie. Low re cot and a four in hand are all these things, and a half Windsor are all these things. You see what's going on here? We're taking something in the world and we're representing it with symbolic languages, which is exactly what we're doing in mathematics. And this is not something new. This is an excerpt from um, Leibniz from the 1600s, where he actually represents nature and what happens outside in nature. But we can do this with other things as well. And one thing that I really like is juggling, juggling balls, clubs, whatever. Um, and in juggling, you can give numbers names and the names in no, um, throws names. Uh, and in particular, you can use number to, to describe throws. A four is a, is a, it's a powerful throw that takes four beats before it lands. And a one is something that lands immediately. And then we can put it into computer and then we can, um, uh, look at what these patterns look like. So uh, on the left side, you see uh, this little figure uh, juggling a pattern called three. And on the right side, you see a pattern called four, four, one. Now you can do three in reverse, or you can do three with your arms crossed. And I would be happy to demonstrate these things to you, um, but it's much easier to show them on the computer. In particular, um, difficult tricks like this, or four, two, three, mils mess, they are possible to do in person. And, but this here is a little bit more difficult. This is 97531. And um, if you look very, very closely, you see that all the balls change order. They land in the opposite direction of which they are thrown. So with this apparatus, you can do so much more. 
This is an example from Gandini, um, where they're juggling uh, rhythmically together, 4-4-1 four, four, on the edges and in the middle with four balls, a pattern called 5-3-4. The P stands for a pass. So um, um, he's passing the ball to the people on the edge. So this is the world of, of juggling patterns being described by symbolic languages. And that's what mathematics is about. So let's do a simple exercise with four thirds. And you know, this is a number. And I have a particular philosophy, which is that uh, in order to understand something, you should look at it from different perspectives. You should try to look at it from many, 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 many different sides and see um, if you get more out of it. So let's try and do that with this, with this example. Let's um, look at the ordinary way of describing four thirds, which is 1.33333, but you have to have the three dots. Otherwise, it's not really four thirds. It's just almost four thirds. So you need all of them. But this is only in base 10. You can also do this exercise in base two, binary numbers. So this is 1.01010101 and so on. And you can represent it in many different ways, depending on your number system. You don't have to use infinitely many digits. You can also use finitely many digits and represent the number in this way. But I like representing things more visually. So this might also be a simple way to describe four thirds in the unary um, system where four dots represent four and three dots represent three. But we could do it even more visually maybe by doing four across and three down and you might have seen this rectangle before, and we can think about the slope of the line, how steep it is, and see that, oh yeah, that's four thirds or three fourths, depending on your perspective. And we can play along even more. I mean, this is your ordinary computer screen. Very often you have these resolutions and four thirds is really a relationship between how wide something is and why, how tall something is. So this is a little bit wider than it is taller and therefore we say that it's four thirds. But we can do even another game. So look very closely at these two wheels. Which wheel rotates faster? I hope you agree with me that the top wheel rotates faster. And in fact, it rotates around exactly four times in the same time as the bottom wheel rotates three. So if we draw a line across and a line up and put a little dot there, we can look at how this dot dances around. And what is remarkable is that if we trace this dot around, we get a pattern. We get a, a, a particularly beautiful pattern, I think. And, and these have been um, discussed in literature and art um, for a very long time. But we can think of it as a representation of four thirds. And it doesn't stop there. We can also listen to four thirds. So this is the sound of 440 hertz. This is a computer generated sound, and this is uh, two times that frequency. So this is 880 Hertz. Now we can just take the sound and we can multiply it with a number like three halves or 1.5. And then we get this sound. And this is what's called a perfect fifth. But we're interested in four thirds. We want to learn more about it so we can listen to the number. And it sounds like this. This is the sound of a perfect fourth, or this is the sound of four thirds. Now, frequencies are, you know, something that happens over time. So if we slow things down, we can actually make a drum beat out of four thirds. So we, if we do this rhythm here, one, two, three, there are three beats in a certain time. We can now do four beats in the same time, and it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. Kind of boring, but together they make something interesting. And we can add a little hi-hat maybe, like this one. And of course, we can add a cowbell. <laughs> Now, admittedly, this might uh, sound a little, um, you know, sterile, but this is the sound of four thirds. This comes out of an experiment that we did by just taking four and three and thinking about what that really means. 
So what I want to get across to you is that in order to understand something, we need to look at it from different perspectives. That is how we obtain understanding. And if you think about it, this is what we're doing in mathematics. So look at this equation. This says x plus x equals 2 times x. What this really is, it is a symbolic representation of a pattern. The pattern is that 2 plus 2 equals 2 times 2, 3 plus 3 equals 2 times 3, 4 plus 4 equals 2 times 4, 5 plus 5 equals 2 times 5, and so on. You see the pattern? Something plus something equals 2 times something. And we take that pattern and represent it symbolically with these symbols. These symbols represent this pattern, and it also takes a number and represent it in two different ways, on the left as a sum and on the right as a multiplication. But we must not forget that this is a symbolic representation of a pattern where you look at the number in two different ways. You might think of this as a metaphor or an analogy, in fact. There are so many nice connections between mathematics and language, and this is one of these beautiful relations. And Patterns are everywhere, and we recognize things because of repetition. Like I did with this example, we also recognize these as the letter F. We see immediately that this one is F because we've seen so many of them. So the fact that we are getting used to things um, enable us to understand something and recognize them as such. And that is ultimately what mathematics is about. We're seeing something a lot of times and we're representing it with symbols. Now, there is a quote that I want to discuss with you a little bit. And this this quote that comes up on the screen. In mathematics, you don't understand things. You just get used to them. This was said by John von Neumann, who was an incredible mathematician. And it's sort of discouraging because he's saying that, you know, you really don't understand things. You just get used to them. There's an important question here, which is how do you know the difference between what you have gotten used to and things you really understand? What is the real difference? And that is a very, very difficult thing to explain and answer. We all have this feeling that we gain understanding. We, we go up a, a staircase and we level up like a computer game, you, you reach the next level and you have this feeling that now I understand it. I did not understand it before, but now I understand it. So my question to you is what happened? What did you get um, before you had this feeling that I don't understand it at all? Think about Rubik's cube, for example, this, this thing here that I have uh, on my desk. You know, You have a feeling that you don't understand it, but suddenly you feel that you understand it a little bit. So my question is, what happened in between? My simple answer is that you got another perspective. And I think understanding is tied to perspectives, that you see something from another point of view, that you experience it in a different way. You don't know what good music is until you have experienced bad music. And you don't really understand what music is if you don't experience a lot of different types of music. The same thing with food. You don't really know what you like to eat until you have tasted a lot of different things. So you gain perspectives. So an expert at something is always a person with many different perspectives on that thing. You're never going to meet an expert at something who is not rich in perspectives. So that's something I want. I want to have a richness in perspectives and in particular with mathematics. So you can take a sphere and you don't really understand if it's round or not, if you don't look at it from all different angles. And there's one particular perspective that is so important and it's the perspective of the opposite, what something is not. So when you think about something, Try also to think about what the opposite is. If you cannot answer what the opposite is, I don't think you really understand what it is. I don't think you understand something until you know the opposite of it. This is not a new thought, but it's a very, very useful thought, in fact. In class, in mathematics class or whatever class you're in, you can ask yourself, what is the opposite of this thing? 
So what is the opposite of a rational number? What is the opposite of a function? You have to give examples of some things that are not numbers in order to understand numbers. You have to give examples of the opposite of functions in order to understand functions. So you always have to view something from both sides, from inside out and also outside in. Until you do that, you don't really understand what it is, I think. So I like to play with perspectives and I like for us to use our imagination to play with uh, our perspectives, because you can always imagine that some things are different. If you look at something, you can play with it in your mind. You can try to figure out what can I change about this thing and it still remains the same. If I take this cube and I, I sort of take it apart bit by bit, at some point it's no longer a cube, but when is that? So you can do this in your mind with anything you, you have this tremendous freedom in science and mathematics in particular, in which you can use your imagination to imagine almost anything. There is no limit. So I want to have a, uh, on the screen a little happier quote than the last one. This is from Georg Kantor, and he is the inventor of modern set theory. Around 100 years ago, um, a little more actually than 100 years ago, uh, he invented our conception of um, sizes of sets, how big sets are also in terms of infinity. But the quote is this, the essence of mathematics lies in its freedom. That's a different answer. So mathematics for Cantor is really this um, place in which you can imagine anything. You're free to assume whatever you want, but you have to take the consequences of it. And he in fact discovered that there are some sets that are more infinite than other sets. So he was the inventor of our modern concept of something called cardinality, the sizes of sets. And he also discovered that for any set, there's always a, a set that has a greater cardinality. And that is a beautiful, beautiful discovery. I personally like to use my computer to play and use my imagination. So I want to say a little bit about how mathematics and computer science um, belongs together. Because these fields, for me, they are the same. But for many people, they are um, very far apart. And I think computer science is something that brings to us a tool for using our imagination and be creative and artistic in a way that is um, incredible and very, very beautiful. So let me um, try and uh, lure you into my world of creative coding with computers and how that is related to mathematics. There's a term you should really search for on the internet, which is creative coding. Taking um, coding and programming, which you can use for all sorts of things and being creative with it. And in particular, you can use it to explore mathematics. There are a lot of tools that you can use, uh, tools that range from Scratch, which is not um, text-based, but is um, based on blocks that you pull around, and processing, which I will show some examples of now and P5, which is the same as processing is for Java, but for something called JavaScript. You have Arduino for hardware. You also have Microbit, which is this little platform here, which you can explore programming things. You don't have to program things on the screen. You can actually program things in the real world. So let me show you one of these, which is processing, um, an environment that is uh, beautiful. This is a program, uh, an environment, and a language that you can download free from the internet. It works on all platforms. Uh, it is open source. It is completely free, like I said, and it has a huge community around the world that will help you if you want to get into programming. So when you download it first, it looks like this, and you write some code. You don't need to understand what that means, but if you press play, you get this. And this is all the code you need to do exactly that. And you change the code around a little bit, and you press play, and you get something else. So. With processing, you can do all sorts of things. And I'll show you one example of the things that I have done uh, first with things. So um, I put on uh, headgear with my university. I hired some students and we went to a roller coaster theme park um, to investigate roller coasters. So in the background here, you see a wooden roller coaster. We put up a little booth. We invited television to come film. Uh, what we did was put cameras on ourselves and um, record the, uh, the acceleration. So um, here is uh, my friend and we are 
currently analyzing what is going on. So I will now take you on a little um, trip into this uh, particular roller coaster, which is a, basically a big pendulum that swings back and forth. And let's have a look at what happened. Here we are. <laughs> I know there's a lot of things going on on the screen. On the right side, there's the acceleration data that we measured with Arduino. Today, I would probably use uh, Microbit. And um, the left side of the screen, uh, bottom left, is our visualization of these forces with processing. And we put everything together and um, synced it up with the video. So this was a fun experiment for us in order to do, we could take data in the real world and we can process it and make something beautiful out of it with computers. So I've used processing for a lot of different things. So I'll, I want to show you some more examples. I showed you this one earlier. and. Um, this is available on Twitter if you want to see it in the bottom right hand corner is my Twitter handle. Um, but what you're seeing here is basically just triangles and I've tried to highlight some of them for you. Here are six triangles and you see that they just rotate in place. They just rotate uh, exactly where they are, but um, at the same speed, but a little bit shifted um, in terms of their angle. And I think these are 90 rotating triangles um, going around. And the fun thing about computer programming is that you can experience and play with mathematics and get a lot of different perspectives on the same thing. So with the same program, I can program something uh, else. I can use my same program to visualize triangles differently. This is exactly the same program, but the triangles are now um, opaque. They're a different color. They're a different size, but they're the same number and they still rotate in the same way. So this is a very hands-on way in which I can gain experience with mathematics by playing around with computer programming. And that is so amazing. Here's another example of the same program just being used a little bit differently. So here I'm basically making a kind of a dragon's tail or something. And here uh, they're rotating around, uh, not around its center, but um, they are keeping their angle, but rotating around the center a little bit differently, not like this, but but like this. Um, so that's one example of that. But in processing, you can do all sorts of things. For example, this is a 3D illustration of an, something called an octahedron. This is made out of eight triangles. And the funny thing about an octahedron is that it looks differently um, if you look at it from different perspectives. So it looks like a hexagon if you look at it from one perspective, but it looks like a square if you look at it from another perspective. So it's a really interesting uh, figure, the octahedron. Um, here is another example of how you can morph 3D things from one thing to another. So on the right-hand side, you see a cube. So that's uh, like at three o'clock, if you think about a clock. And approximately at you know between seven or eight o'clock, you see something called a dodecahedron, a regular dodecahedron. And in the middle, you have something called a stellated dodecahedron, which is the one you see at the very top at 12 o'clock. So these are some of the things that you can play with yourself. Um, and I one day, I got a little bored with this one, so I make it look a little funnier. So I made it uh, boink a little bit, or whatever you say, give it a little bit more spring tension. And But it's the same program. I'm just playing with my computer program. And by doing so, I'm learning about the cube. I'm learning about the dodecahedron and they are related. They are basically uh, just both part of the same structure. So by using programming, I can hands-on get different perspectives on different things. I can see that the cube is clearly related to the dodecahedron. And so it goes. One day I, I wanted to experience um, and play with ellipses. So ellipses you can make in many different ways. So I created a program to play with ellipses. So these are two artistic renditions of uh, the tangent of an ellipsis made um, out of lines that go through points on a circle. Uh, but I also got a little bored with this one. So here is a little bit more colorful version of the same thing. Now, the, my point here is that this is the same program. It's exactly the same program, but I'm doing something different with it instead of 
um, drawing these beautiful, long, transparent lines. I'm drawing them thicker and having more fun with it. Anyway, there are a lot of examples of this. I've also visualized card shuffling. These are some examples of uh, art that I have created that have been exhibited. So these have um, these uh, have been in galleries, and these uh, represent different ways of shuffling cards. Now, there's a long story to this. I cannot go into detail, but on the left side, you see six perfect out shuffles of 64 cards. Perfect shuffles is where you take every other card and um, shuffle them together. Uh, I've also used processing to play with networks and graphs. So these are some of the um, things that I have created before. But um, I also like to have fun with uh, extremes. So one day I was curious, how do you make a heart? How do you draw a heart? So the way to draw a heart is to put these little uh, levers on them. And then you can make a lot of different hearts. You have a lot of freedom when you do this. So what I wanted to do was um, play a little bit with all, that tremendous amount of freedom. So if you look in the middle, you sort of have all these things working together. On the left side, I'm doing like not enough. It's a little boring. On the right hand side, I'm doing too much. You know, uh, you're squishing it too much. But the fun thing about it is that when you have um, this setup, you can put all of them together and play around with it like this. And there are so many other stories like this in which you can take the computer and you can experience with programming yourself and have fun with, uh, with mathematics. So you can also create uh, models of um, the real world, so to speak. Um, I would like to show you some examples of real things that uh, you can do with uh, computers after apparently more hearts uh, are coming onto the screen. This is a love letter, I called it. Yeah, uh, But you can take real things like a leaf and you can use the computer to model it. So here I'm also using processing and trying to mimic what happens in a leaf. Uh, and this I did after reading an article and this is uh, the article in question in which um, you analyze the patterns in leaves and use computers to model it. And the algorithm and the computer program that came out of it uh, does exactly this. So you see a lot of these little uh, green dots and then they kind of pull on the branches and pull on the points so that you uh, generate a, a tree um, that has sort of these vein structures. And with more green dots, you get a more dense packing of everything. So these are just some examples of the things you can use the computer to, to play with. Um, another example is this one where these bubbles uh, fall down and when they um, hit this thing at the bottom, they freeze. You see that? So the bubbles come and when the bubbles hit something that already has frozen, it also freezes and you draw a line between the centers of the circles. And what comes out of that is a beautiful tree structure. And if you speed that up a little bit, you get this sort of thing, which is reminiscent of a, of a real tree. This is co something called DLA or diffusion limited aggregation. So um, in, in interest of time, I will um, skip some of these other examples, um, but I will jump uh, to uh, a few more examples of models. Um, this is um, uh, how fire spreads in a, in a forest, depending on the density. Also using a computer to simulate real things and looking at different versions of the same thing, depending on density. And here's a simple example of simulating a wave. You know, that's one of the simplest things you can do. There, it's, it's how a wave actually is. Now, the fun thing about computers is that you can experiment with it and, for example, turn on gravitation. So now, instead of simulating a wave, I can simulate gravitation like this. But anyway, this is a part of my world of mathematics. I want to show you one last little video clip uh, of one of my favorite uh, mathematicians of all time. His name is John Conway, and unfortunately, he passed away this year, um, early this year, because of COVID. And, um, but there's a beautiful video clip that I want to show you in which he talks about what mathematics is. And uh, here it is. Let's have a look at John Conway for a second. You know, people think that mathematics is complicated. Mathematics is the simple bit. It's the stuff we can understand. It's cats that are complicated. 
I mean, what is it in those little molecules and stuff that make up make one cat behave differently to another, or that make a cat? You know, how do you define a cat? I have no idea. <laughs> so if you think mathematics is difficult, think about cats. And my last plea is um, for you to make errors, lots of errors, and uh, and learn from them. This is a beautiful poem by Pete Hein. Uh, it goes like this. The road to wisdom, well, it's plain and simple to express. Err and err, then err again, but less and less and less. Thank you very much. Uh, this was my little talk about what mathematics is. And I have been challenged to present an art challenge. So shall I do this now and go straight into it? Yes, I think so. Right. So I know that um, in your amazing school, you're based on projects. I would like to present this art challenge to you um, to create what I call a complete space. Now, what is a complete space? Let's talk a little bit about this. So a complete space is a complete universe, a complete world, or a complete enumeration, or a complete list. So I want you to make up a rule, whatever, whatever it is, and find all candidates. For example, if you think about um, dice, a dice or a die, depending on your language, can be one, two, three, four, or five, or six. So this is the complete space. These are all the possibilities. Now, once you have the rule, I want you to check for errors. For example, don't list something twice. And also, don't put something in there that is not correct. So finally, find a way to make art out of this. So in this case, we could, for example, put them up like this and put the little dots in between. And then we have a piece of art. So this is what I mean by a complete space. I want to show you some more examples. Um, one of my favorite complete spaces comes from uh, a Japanese incense tradition called Genjiko. And this is where you smell incenses and try to identify similarities. So let's say that you have three different things that you smell. If they're all different, this is a way to visualize that. If the two first smells um, are the same and the last is different, you can visualize this or represent it in this way if the first and the third, the last, are the same, but the, there's something different in the middle, this is one way to illustrate that. And if the first is different from the two last, but the two last are the same, this is one way to visualize that. Or maybe they're all the same. And I hope you agree with me that these are all the possibilities. Either they're all different, or they're all the same, or it's something in between. So this is a complete space. And we can think about this um, as sets of numbers even. So on the left is the numbers one, two, three, all separated. On the right, it's one, two, three together. But what does it look like with four? Well, with four, you have a lot of different possibilities. And this is the whole space of um, um, four. And there should be 15 of them here. And what does it look like for five? Well, it looks like this. And these are all the 52 possibilities for five different things. So in the upper left-hand corner, they're all different. In the bottom right-hand corner, they're all the same. And this has been used in art, in uh, Japanese um, um, literature, work of literature called um, Tale of Genji. This was used as cover art. Now it had, I think it had 54 chapters. So they had to reuse two of them, but this is a complete space. This is the complete space of possibilities. Um, and you can, you can look it up if you want to, it's called Genji Ko. It's referring to an incense, incense game. Now you can do this with letters. So if you do, just do two letters, A and B, these are all the possibilities. If you do three letters, there are six possibilities, A, B, C, A, C, B, B, A, C, B, C, A, C, A, B, C, C, B, A. There, these are all the possible ways you can have three elements in order. This is what mathematicians called permutations. With four elements, you get a lot more. And these are all the different possibilities with four. So these are all examples of complete spaces. Now they can be more visual, 
This is something I did earlier today. So every row here is different. So every row here is um, different. At the top, we have two white. Second row, the one with the one, number one, has a white and a black, and then a black and a white, and then two blacks. These are the only four possibilities you can do with two cells. With three cells, you get eight. All white at the top, all black at the bottom. How about four? Well, now we have four white at the top, four black at the bottom, and these are all the things in between. So these are also complete spaces. So here are more examples. And you might recognize these as so-called binary numbers or uh, binary representations of numbers. Now, if we wanted to play with this, we can put it on a circle. So these are two, this is for three, this is for four, this is for five, this is for six, this is for seven, this is for eight. So these are also um, images of complete spaces. Just to wrap up, there are some examples um, that you can look at that there are this is a beautiful comic called xkcd uh, in one of the comics number 832 he is showing you all the possible um, moves you can do in tic-tac-toe so if you play optimally so you can look at the link if you want to look at that or the game set this is a card game in which you uh, have to identify sets and there are exactly 81 different cards and here are all of them. So this is also a complete space. Now, um, this is something I used in my book. These are all the 512 ways to combine three dots with three dots or in mathematically speaking, all subsets of um, this product. Now, you don't have to understand this. I'm going to go give you some more complicated examples and then I'll finish off. Um, these are all the functions from one, two, three to one, two, three. These are all the functions from one, two, three to one, two, three, four. These are visualizations of mathematical functions, but these are all the functions you can have. So for example, here in the top left corner, you have three lines going to the same dot. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you have the three lines to, the, to another dot. And then you have all the different possibilities in between. So this is another example of that. Um, I have to warn you that you might get into trouble because if you have um, a rule that is hard, you might not be able to do this. So let me give you a, a, a little more difficult example. This is my final example. It's also something I prepared in the last couple of days. So these are graphs. These are the only two graphs that you can make with nodes and edges where you have, um, they're called connected. So you have three dots or three nodes and you have to um, put edges in such that everything is together. So you can reach any node from any other node by following the edges. That's the definition of connected. Now there are only two with three nodes and these are all the ones you can get with four nodes. There are six of them. And if you play around, you will see that these are, only, these are the only six. So this is also a complete space. And there are 21 with four nodes and with five nodes, here are all 112 of them. So you see in the bottom right-hand corner, you have uh, a chain of five uh, in a row. That should be six, actually. All the numbers are wrong. So this is three nodes, this is four nodes, this is five nodes, and this is six nodes. So the numbers are wrong. I'm very sorry about that. In the top left corner, you have six nodes where everything is connected to everything. So. Uh, unfortunately, then the end of end of this is actually wrong, uh, or is it? Yeah, it should say it should say um, um, uh, two connected graphs with three nodes. Um, I'm tempted to correct this on the fly, but uh, I suspect that will take a minute that I don't have. And these are all the six connected graphs with four nodes. These are all the 21 connected graphs with five nodes, and these are the 112 connected graphs with six nodes. And the result is this uh, sequence of numbers. And if you look it up on the website like this, you, um, it will tell you that uh, you're on the right track. And the next number is 853. The point is that these are all complete spaces. So that's my challenge to you. Create a complete space and make art of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. 
Muchísimas gracias, doctor Antonsen. Ha sido una conferencia maravillosa. Nos ha abierto un montonón de caminos para pensar no solamente las matemáticas, sino pensar la, qué es la comprensión y todo lo que podemos hacer entre arte y matemáticas. Estamos seguros que todas las personas que nos están acompañando van a aceptar eh, caminar este, este gran reto que nos ha puesto de, de trabajo. Entonces, muchísimas gracias, muchísimas gracias. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And what you're doing in your school is, is amazing. So thank you. Hey, muchas gracias. Seguramente nos veremos muchas más veces para, para traerlo aquí a Colombia y para, para disfrutar de su conocimiento. Muchas gracias. Bueno, nuevamente les presento a Laura Gómez Bermeo, una mujer joven, matemática, eh, haciendo todo un esfuerzo inmenso en la educación matemática, en la divulgación de la matemática y pues hubo un encuentro maravilloso entre la organización de este cerebro matemático eh, por parte del Colegio Hacienda de los Alcaparros y cuando acudimos a la Sociedad Colombiana de Matemáticas pues obviamente entraron a hacer un apoyo y a desarrollar también sus propias iniciativas. De manera, Laura, que te cedo la palabra para que nos cuentes muy bien eh, cómo va a ser este camino en el resto del año. Gracias. Bueno, muy buenos días para todos y todas. Eh, es un gusto estar acá, me encanta y felicito mucho al Colegio Hacienda Los Alcaparros por abrir estos espacios tan importantes para que más niños, niñas, jóvenes y también adultos pues empiecen a querer un poquito más las matemáticas y tengamos estos espacios donde pues podamos eh, seguirlas queriendo tal como eh, lo hacemos y seguir como alimentando toda esta curiosidad matemática. Eh, como nos dice Rosita, yo estoy aquí para hacerles una invitación muy especial. Bueno, en realidad son dos. La primera es para que no olviden eh, realizar su reto, su challenge, y no olviden usar los siguientes hashtags. Es Cerebro Matemático y eh, hashtag IDM2021. Ya les voy a decir por qué este segundo. Entonces, sus retos los pueden compartir en las redes sociales y también pueden compartirlos en el correo electrónico exchange arroba alcaparros .edu .co. Entonces, eh, pues para que todos estén eh, súper pendientes de, de lo que viene y hagan sus eh, retos. Eh, la segunda invitación importante va a ser eh, el Día Internacional de las Matemáticas. Desde hace dos años se ha declarado eh, desde la UNESCO el Día Internacional de las Matemáticas y eh, el próximo año vamos a hacer una celebración que va a ser de toda una semana. En esta semana van a encontrar conferencistas internacionales, también vamos a tener matemáticos y matemáticas colombianos que van a estar hablando sobre matemáticas a todo tipo de público, niños, niñas, jóvenes, van a estar eh, también charlas para adultos de matemáticas aplicadas, vamos a tener un panel sobre educación, también vamos a tener un cineforo sobre eh, películas o capítulos, por ejemplo, de los Simpsons que hablen de matemáticas, vamos a tener un día especial para que los niños, las niñas y los jóvenes hagan preguntas a matemáticos y a matemáticas sobre qué es lo que hacen, qué es lo que les gusta, eh, etc. Vamos a tener también un día especial para hablar sobre las matemáticas con mujeres matemáticas en el Día Internacional de las Matemáticas y va a ser muy importante que estén pendientes de este día porque en esta semana vamos a tener una de las charlas de esta serie de Cerebro Matemático. Van a ser todas unas charlas abiertas, esperamos llegar a los diferentes rincones del país y que podamos eh, aunar esfuerzos de las diferentes actividades que van a estar eh, en este día, que como les digo es internacional, así que alrededor del mundo vamos a estar celebrando a todos los que nos gustan las matemáticas. Bueno, después de esta invitación, eh, tengo acá unas preguntas que han sido seleccionadas para hacer a Roger. Eh, que los estudiantes y las estudiantes hicieron durante estas semanas. Entonces voy a empezar para que eh, Roger nos ayude a responder estas preguntas que la verdad están súper interesantes. Yo leí 
la mayoría de las que estaban y me gusta mucho el entusiasmo que tienen todas estas preguntas eh, y la curiosidad eh, que, que todos los estudiantes tienen. Así que, Roger, tienes una tarea en algunas preguntas un poquito difícil porque hay algunas que están, o sea, yo me quedé pensando en varias como yo no sabría qué responder, pero estoy segura que tú nos vas a poder ayudar a responder varias de ellas. Entonces vamos con la primera. La primera eh, eh, nos dice eh, que cómo algo tan exacto como las matemáticas puede explicar eh, algo tan inexacto y tan impredecible como el mundo real. Oh, thank you. That's a wonderful question. Um, now, I hope everybody can see and hear me. Um, so what we have to um, keep in mind is that um, mathematics contains uh, a symbolic um, and but also a very precise language to represent things. So there's another word that is very important, which is model. We make a model of a thing in the world and every model is um, to put it on uh, an extreme, uh, just a model. We, you, with a model, you're always missing some things and you're focusing on other things. It's like the map and the territory. If you have a map of a territory, your map will work for some things, but not other things. If you change the map, then you will get some things, but not other things. You're always missing something. The only correct map is the territory itself. And that is also the case with mathematics. When you use mathematics in the real world, you're creating a map for a certain territory. And by doing so, you're missing some things. So you can only represent and, and calculate and think about the things you're actually representing precisely. There are always some other things that you're missing. So you, you the real world is is inexact in and unpredictable and chaotic and wild. And we can also represent aspects of that with, with mathematics. But I think the real takeaway is that you're, you're always missing something, but you can also, you're always capturing some things really well. I, th I think there are a lot more I can say about this um, because maybe the person that asked the question um, was actually asking about chaos and, and, and dynamical systems and really complex behavior. For example, like spreading a virus. How can we with mathematics understand this? And we, the answer is that we can build models of these phenomena, but also the models can be good for some things uh, and, and they will not be good for everything, but we can create very, very good models, but not perfect models. Muchas gracias, Roger. Creo que nos diste un buen inicio del panorama. Lo que dice Roger es cierto, las matemáticas lo que tratan de alguna manera es traducir lo que está pasando en el mundo en un lenguaje en el que podamos manejarlo, modelarlo. Eh, y bueno, estos modelos nos dan diferentes escenarios de lo que puede pasar con cierto fenómeno. Vamos entonces con la segunda pregunta, Roger, eh, y es la siguiente. Si la imaginación es parte integral de las matemáticas y de entender las matemáticas, ¿por qué los colegios en el, eh, en el mundo se enfocan en las operaciones y no en, eh, digamos que en las operaciones, supongo como en la parte algebraica, y no en las diferentes perspectivas? I think the The, the simple answer is that it is much easier to focus on these things that are clearly defined than focusing on uh, much vaguer things like the imagination and creativity and perspectives. I would say it's very, very unfortunate that many mathematics classes are too focused on very, very procedural methods and not focused on understanding because um, There is a nice analogy between mathematics and music uh, and also making food. So let me uh, do that a little bit. What, what if, you, if you were learning music, but all you were learning was to read notes and to transpose notes and to write beautiful, beautiful notes and beautiful keys, 
but never listen to music, never play in a band, never have fun with music, you know? And unfortunately, that's how a lot of mathematics is taught. Not everywhere. Um, fortunately, many places you are listening to music, you're playing music, you're playing with it. It's also the same with cooking and making food. Um, if all you're doing is following recipes and never experiment, never tasting strange food, never trying yourself to cook something up, which is very, very strange. What if I put garlic into here? What if I put more lemon? Uh, how long should, should this be in the oven? And things like that. Unless you experiment, you're not going to find out what things are. Of course, it's much easier to teach procedures and algorithms. And uh, like with music, it's much easier to just teach recipes. But I think um, the answer why are we doing this is very hard. It's a cultural thing. And it's ultimately, it's because it's easier to teach this. So my Gracias. plea is that we should play more and, and yes. experience more the, the, the whole plethora of, of mathematics. Bueno, vamos entonces con la tercera pregunta. Y esta eh, es una pregunta que incluso eh, he escuchado mucho en las redes sociales y eh, en esta nueva red social que es TikTok. Eh, y es eh, una pregunta que además se ha hecho grandes matemáticos a lo largo de la historia. Y es la siguiente. ¿Son los números una invención humana para tratar de entender eh, o pretender que se o tratar de entender o pretender que se entiende eh, qué opinas well there this is an old question whether or not mathematics and numbers in particular are invented or discovered you know is it something about the universe that we're uh, revealing that always is there so if, if every one of us were dead and the earth was gone will there still be numbers and will seven and 13 still be prime numbers? Or is this something uh, inherent to being human and having experiences? Now, my answer is that mathematics and numbers um, are dual, it's both. It's both has a component that is discovered and a component that is invented. And think about games. I think games is a beautiful metaphor. So the game of chess. You can ask, is it invented or discovered? Well, the rules of chess are sort of invented because somebody made up the rules and the rules could have been different. Maybe the queen could move different than what it did. Maybe jump over some pieces. Um, but we discover the consequences of the game because once the rules are set, we discover properties of the game. So this is a good move. This is a bad move. So And so it is with mathematics. It has both sides. It is on the one hand invented. There's so much invention and there's so much discovery too. So we discover properties of numbers. So um, seven is a prime number because you cannot um, factor it like six, you can factor into two times three. You can't do that with seven. So seven is a, an atom, it is a prime number. You cannot subdivide it further. And that's a thing we discover, I think. That's my personal opinion. So the people that believe that are so-called Platonists. Um, uh -huh. Anyway. Sí, de hecho, esto es muy discutido. Para muchos matemáticos, la matemática es como más bien eh, la creación a partir de las necesidades que ha tenido el hombre. Entonces, los números nacen porque yo, pues digamos que nuestros ancestros necesitaban contar su rebaño, cuántas vacas tenían, cuántas personas habían, después ya necesitaban ver si se les perdían o empezaban a hacer préstamos, entonces ya nacieron los números, eh, los negativos, después ya necesitaban dividir terrenos, entonces salieron las fracciones, pero también, como dice Roger, pues eh, ha existido también como más allá de la necesidad, como un interés particular eh, del conocimiento, como lo que tú dices de hacer música, eh, como ese interés del, del espíritu de, de ir un poco más allá. Entonces, eh, bueno, esperamos que hay, haya quedado, hay mucho más acerca al respecto y creo que la siguiente pregunta tiene mucho que ver con lo que hablamos anteriormente y es si existe una relación entre las matemáticas y la filosofía. 
Oh, yes, there are many. And I've been very interested in the foundations of mathematics. So why is something true? And how do we know that it is true? In mathematics, you have something beautiful and amazing, and it's called proof. When you have a proof of something, it means that um, you have an argument that convinces you of the truthfulness of whatever it is. But then a very difficult question comes. It is, what is a proof? And what is truth? So ultimately, there are so many connections between philosophy and mathematics, and it has to do with the truth of things, why something is true. And incidentally, that's why magic is so fun. And magicians, that they play with your conception of truth. They make something disappear, they make something float, and it's impossible. You know that this is impossible because things don't float and they cannot just disappear. They have to exist somewhere. And they're playing with your conception of truth. The same thing with mathematics. It, it um, informs you and tells you and inspires you to think about what is true. So ultimately, mathematics is not about only numbers. It's about patterns and, and what are the true patterns of our reality, so to speak. And that's when you find the truth. So. Okay. Vamos con la última pregunta por ahora. Nos quedan dos que después vamos a responder. Pero eh, esta es una de las que a mí más me gusta y es eh, cómo las matemáticas nos ayudan a ser mejores seres humanos. Um, well, there's an objective answer and a subjective answer to that. I think the objective answer is that, you know, we can make the world better by, you know, we can invent vaccines and medicine and we can use mathematics to predict the future. But for me, subjectively, the most important thing is that it makes us more um, open-minded and, and understanding of each other. I think for me, mathematics has been uh, an experience in, 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 in um, an exercise in changing my perspective. So I really understand something when I'm forced to think about it differently, solving a problem, um, being challenged because I only look at things one way. So it's making my mind more flexible. It's making me more empathetic with other people. It's making me more uh, open-minded and understanding and tolerant. So um, it's also teaching me that there are other perspectives as valuable as my own perspective. So it's making me uh, hopefully better by learning that the, about the importance of having a flexible mind, really, and being flexible. And that's, uh, that's ultimately how I view mathematics and its importance. Bueno, yo ya entonces me despido. Muchas gracias, Roger. Eh, un último comentario al respecto de esta pregunta. Para mí, las matemáticas nos hace ser mejores ciudadanos, eh, nos hace ser más críticos, nos hace ser libres, porque eh, al saber matemáticas somos muy, digamos que menos fácil de manipular, por ejemplo, con las promociones, con un montón de cosas que están siempre rodeándonos. Y si sabemos matemáticas, estamos ahí. Eh, para los chicos y chicas que están acá, las matemáticas también es como cuando uno juega un deporte y se está entrenando todo el tiempo. Yo les digo a mis estudiantes a veces cuando hacemos muchos como ejercicios y dicen como, pero esto para qué, les digo como muchos de ustedes por ejemplo juegan fútbol o yo por ejemplo nado y a veces tengo que hacer muchas abdominales, seguramente cuando juego fútbol o nado no voy a hacer abdominales pero eso ayuda a toda mi formación. Entonces, eso mismo pasa con muchos ejercicios de matemáticas que a veces nos preguntan a los profes, ¿y eso para qué me sirve? Bueno, eso nos sirve para seguir construyendo esta estructura matemática que nos ayuda a ser más críticos, más libres, más responsables. Ahora sí me despido, muchas gracias por esta invitación, por este espacio. Los espero el próximo año en el Día Internacional de las Matemáticas, que va a ser una semana internacional de las matemáticas, no les dije la fecha, es en marzo, va a ser del 8 al 14, el Día Internacional de las Matemáticas es el 14 de marzo, por eh, pi, por el número pi, entonces 3,14, entonces el mes 3, el día 14. Nos vemos allá, eh, Roger, muchas gracias por este espacio, por esta conversación, y felicitaciones por esta gran charla, que estoy viendo muchos comentarios en el Thank chat so de much. personas que les encantó. Eh, Rosita, sigue tú, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Laura.
Pues tenemos unas preguntas muy, muy interesantes en el, de los matemáticos que están acompañándonos, ¿no? Hay, hay, unas, hay una pregunta, por ejemplo, que me parece bellísima, como de qué manera los patrones ocultos de la naturaleza, como el viento, la energía, el agua, el movimiento, eh, son susceptibles de ser simulados y crear modelos matemáticos de ellos. No sé, Roger, si quieres responder esa pregunta. Sí, yeah. so we're, we're seeing today um, a tremendous application of simulation in data science as is, 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 is a part of that. And I think with, the, with computers, simulating nature has, has become really something remarkable. But if we, if we take two or three steps back, it, it um, assumes you are having a model of the world and you are doing things within the model that you're simulating in order to, for example, predict the future. Now, it might very well be that the the prediction is very good and you were um, you because you had a good model or you because you were lucky but it, it's also limited in in several ways For one is, is that it's it's very hard computationally often to to do this for example with weather we're not able to predict very long-term weather but we can do short term very well so it, it, it depends on a lot of things And I think we are going to see more and more of this uh, going forward. Uh, not only um, nature as in weather and, and, and spreading a virus, but also the brain. We can simulate what happens in the brain very interestingly. And um, there's today's machine, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and these things, the, uh, it, which is a way to simulate what go, goes on in the brain more or less naturally. Um, you can do things by simulating the brain naturally, but you can maybe also do very good things simulating it uh, unnaturally by, by simulating something that's not how the brain operates, but still gives you the results. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much to say about how simulations are changing the world because uh, we can also simulate things that we cannot properly understand which is very interesting. So for things we don't have formulas for or things we don't completely understand, we might get insights into them uh, through simulations. So we might be able to simulate and predict things we don't completely understand, which is also very, very interesting. Gracias, Roger. Hay, hay bellísimas preguntas. Por ejemplo, hay una pregunta que nos, que sobre el tema de, de la relación entre las matemáticas y la danza. Cómo, cómo se pueden relacionar, cómo se puede imaginar cosas alrededor de la, de la, de la matemática y la danza. Yes, so choreographers use um, symbolic languages to describe the movements of bodies. There are many uh, examples of this. So one example that I like are uh, an old notation system for tap dancing called con notation. Uh, in which you describe uh, a dance by almost like musical notes. And there are also other, other ways you can, you can describe the movements of the body. And you can uh, then give this description to somebody else that could perform it. And performers today in, in, in professional dance settings, they do this. Um, there, there are many ways, but also I'm sure there are many ways to represent movement and dance that we have not yet invented. Uh, so juggling, in my case, is one example of describing a uh, body movement with numbers. So this is just one simple example of, of that. Mm -hmm. Gracias, Reyes. Y creo que, que la, 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 toda la audiencia está muy encantada y muy, impa y muy impactada con, con tu propuesta de que la comprensión es lograr el mayor, la, el mayor número de perspectivas posibles. Esta hay una pregunta que dice, si, si alguien quisiera comprender completamente y ser un experto en matemáticas, ¿tendría que conocer todas las perspectivas de todos los matemáticos, como lo hizo George Cantor? <laughs> What a wonderful question. I, I don't think it's possible. I think it's impossible to know everything. Um, but you can always hope to understand more. 
So my definition of understanding is, of course, lacking in some respects. It's not only um, multiple perspectives, but I, I want to argue that multiple perspectives is an integral part of understanding. There's much more to uh, uh, understanding than just perspectives. It's having a cognitive structure enabling you to put things in relation to one another. And it's it has to do with the way you represent things. But um, I don't think anybody today has uh, the chance of understanding all of mathematics. Um, it's, a long, it's a long time ago since somebody had the whole overview of all of mathematics in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I have a ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo se relacionan los complete spaces con los fractales? ¿O son fractales? Well, I would argue that um, the way I presented complete spaces, I want to talk about discrete finite spaces. Now, fractals are usually something that you talk about in terms of infinity, and there is some sort of infinite rough structure of things um, in which you can zoom infinitely uh, in some direction and there you have some self-similarity or in, in any case, some sort of roughness, not some sort of smoothness, which is um, really um, assumes that you're doing something infinite. Now you can have infinite complete sets as well, but uh, I should have said that in my description that I'm really talking about finite discrete um, spaces that uh, we should explore. But there are a lot of other ways to do this. So my experiment with the heart, for example, is a, an example of an infinite space because there are infinitely many different hearts you can make. But in, the, in terms of the game set, there's only 81 possibilities. If you have four properties like that, there are only 81 different cards. Muchas gracias. Bueno, tenemos que, tenemos que, voy a terminar con una pregunta que la tenemos todos en la punta en la punta de la lengua para, para terminar este espacio tan agradable de conversación con el doctor Antonsen y es a todos, a profesores, a padres de familia, a todos nos preocupa cómo, cómo lograr que los niños quieran las matemáticas, quieran aprender las matemáticas e involucrarlos con ese maravilloso mundo que usted nos ha escrito hoy. Queremos despedirnos de usted con un último consejo, una última inspiración para todos los que estamos acá y que queremos que nuestros hijos eh, logren el máximo nivel de su desarrollo de pensamiento matemático. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm listening to the translation, so that's why I'm a little bit behind. Yeah. I want everyone to embrace playfulness and play more in terms of puzzles, in terms of games, in terms of having fun, especially games. So I'm talking about board games, uh, social games, other com even computer games. Um, this is something parents can do with their children easily. Play games every day, board games, because you learn so many things. You learn critical thinking, you learn problem solving, you learn how to uh, be a better person because you're going to lose and you're going to fail and you're getting some experience with with dealing with that and you get to practice being constructive and social and and you get to practice respect but you also get the intellectual challenge of winning and and trying to win and and trying to decipher a particular game what is the winning strategy for this particular game so my i hope that everyone can can take with them um, playfulness, playing with games, playing with puzzles, playing computer games, and also finally uh, experimenting with computer programming. I think computer programming, sitting down, creating a computer program that takes no more than um, five minutes to make a program that does something really, really interesting. Um, I think this is uh, such a good way to experiment and play with mathematics. But first and foremost, play, play with everything, computers, games, puzzles, juggling, music, and, and just embrace uh, experimenting with things. Because what you're doing is that you're, you're indirectly learning about mathematics. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. 
si esto no fuera virtual, si estuviéramos en, una, en un auditorio, creo que estaríamos todos aplaudiendo, muy emocionados en el, en el corazón. Eso es lo que estamos viendo en, en el chat, en la admiración de las personas por este bellísimo espacio y esta bellísima conferencia eh, que usted nos ha dado. Pues todo lo bueno tiene un final y hemos llegado pues al final de este coloquio. Quiero recordarle a todas las personas el reto que nos ha puesto de, 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 de trabajo entre arte y matemáticas y que estarán recibiendo eh, pues toda la información para que puedan mandar sus obras de arte y podamos tener un segundo momento en que, en que podamos admirar todo este trabajo. Muchísimas gracias, doctora Antonsen. Realmente nos vamos con el corazón lleno de usted y con el corazón lleno de sus palabras. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Entonces, a todo el mundo que ha invitado para las segundas dos conferencias que tendremos en los, en, los, en los próximos meses y que cerrarán con broche de oro este coloquio que empezó de esta manera. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos en la primera conferencia del coloquio El Severo Matemático. No olvide visitar nuestra página web www.alcaparros.edu.co para enterarse de los siguientes eventos. Los dejamos con la interpretación del grupo de jazz de bachillerato del Colegio Hacienda Los Alcaparros, My Funny Valentine.